All right, so today I want to continue talking about um, you know, the discussion from last time about um, minus one curves on surfaces and this, uh, you know, these toxic diagrams. And uh, today I want to talk about the case where R equals nine, where you have a blow up of P2 along nine points. And the two cases I kind of want to think about, I mean, they're, they're both doing pretty similar, but um, you could have nine general points. Um, but you can also think about, and this is, uh, you know, sometimes a little more interesting, is you can also think about the case where you have the, the nine points uh, equals the intersection of two elliptic curves. So you have two degree three curves, you intersect them, and then you'll get nine points. And in fact, if you take eight general points, then there's a pencil of elliptic curves through them that intersects in a unique ninth one. So this is like, so this is eight general points, and then it determines a unique ninth. That's the cayley bacharach theorem. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is how in this situation you have uh, the, the hypotheses of the cone theorem, well, I mean, well, they do hold, but uh, but the, the but the result you get isn't as nice. So what you get for the cone theorem when uh, minus kx is ample is that you get that the cone of curves and therefore the ample cone is a uh, finitely generated rational polyhedral cone. And so here we have that minus kx is nef, but not ample. So. Um, and I guess so is probably wrong here. And the cone of curves is not finite, finitely generated. So right now, this is like the picture here is going to be sort of, it's going to have like, you know, what the cone theorem tells you is that. You know, if you if you tweak kx a little bit, so if you ask for curves that are not just uh, so, so if you ask for curves that are um, you know negative with respect to kx plus a small ample class, and so the idea is that you know what's our picture? Well, we have uh, I guess if I draw you know if I draw kind of the slice picture here, so this will be like the slice of the cone. Well, we have like a line, and this is, you know, this is dotting with kx. Um, and then everything is on the negative side, but what happens is that you have, you know, over, once you're strictly negative, you have a nice kind of polyhedral kind of picture. But as you get closer to this uh, kx hyperplane, you are going to have infinite sequences of minus one curves. And so you'll have kind of bunching and bunching and you won't get a finitely generated cone. So the goal for today is to kind of explore what's happening in this picture. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is I'm gonna use this formalism of the Coxeter diagram to uh, show that on this blow up there's going to be infinitely many minus one curves. Okay, so let's just recall how that works. So from the last lecture, so we choose minus two classes to generate reflections. On the cone of curves, which, you know, in you know, because we're in dimension two, we can also just think of that as the effective cone, which is, uh, I often have an easier time visualizing myself just because, you know, somehow for me, I'm more comfortable thinking about divisors than curves, mostly because on divisors, you have things like linear equivalence, whereas on curves, you know, the corresponding notion is rational equivalence, which, you know, always seemed to be a little bit fuzzier, whereas linear equivalence is very, you know, concrete. It's just like, oh yeah, this differs by a rational function. 
Okay, and so then the picture you get is you have you have one for L minus E1 minus E2 minus E3, and this is kind of the node jutting off. And then you have E1 minus E2, E2 minus E3, E3 minus E4, these link up, E4 minus E5, etc. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, I'm going to run out of space, so I'll just do it kind of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then this diagram, you know, you straighten it out and it looks like the more familiar one. Whereas if I just eliminated this guy here, I would have E8, but I have a ninth one. So this is not going to give me a finite reflection group. In fact, it's going to give me an infinite one. Okay, so. I think one thing that I should have pointed out last time, which I didn't really mention, was that if you think about what these reflections do, they're chosen, these classes are not just chosen to be minus two curves, but they're also chosen to be minus two curves that are neutral with respect to the canonical divisor. Because the canonical divisor, it's intrinsic to the variety, and so we'd like it to be preserved by all these reflections. And in the R equals eight case, you can even, you know, you can think of the space generated by these as some uh, lattice, and it's exactly the lattice of classes that pair to zero with kx, and also with minus kx. And so by the Hodge index theorem, you're going to get this negative definite lattice, and in fact, it's going to be the E8 lattice in the case of eight points, and the E7 lattice in the case of seven points, etc. Okay, so in fact, you know, that's an immediate connection between this theory of lattices and the theory of del Pezzo surfaces. Okay, and so today we're going beyond the theory of del Pezzo surfaces. We're going to the case where you have one extra point that's been blown up. Okay, so it really simplifies the way we think about this to notice that if you ignore this part of the diagram, you just have E1, you know, you just have classes that swap the EIs. So if you reflect over this E1 minus E2, it's just swapping E1 and E2. Likewise for all the other ones. So what I get here is I get a symmetric group on the nine classes E1, through, uh, yeah, on the, on the nine classes E1 through E9, and then I get an extra reflection, and that's going to allow me to change the L degree up or down. And we really like to, to change it in the up direction. And that's how we're going to get infinitely many minus one curves. Because we've seen before that, you know, once you have you know, a minus one class that's got the right sign with respect to kx, then Riemann rock and some duality shows you actually have a section and then you could conclude from that that it's, oh, it really is a minus one curve. Okay, so let's see how that works for the n equals nine case. Okay, so the idea is we, so given, you know, a minus one curve, so the, the, the biggest minus one curves we got for, I mean, my biggest here, I mean, the ones with the highest uh, degree when you project them down to the P2, you know, we can, we can rearrange, you know, so something like, you know, 6L minus uh, 2E1 minus 2E2 minus et cetera, and then I'm gonna subtract three for one of these. And this was how I got this were the highest degree curves on the um, on the on the degree one del Pezzo. and so you know this I go all the way down to minus two e eight, and I make one of these a three. And so what I can do is I can just use my uh, so I can use my uh, symmetric group to permute around the e's so that the you know these coefficients I, i'll say well they're all negative and then i'll put their magnitudes in decreasing orders so the most negative one will go here the next most negative one goes here and then all the way down and so then i want to reflect across l minus e1 minus e2 minus e3 well, as we recall from last time, what we do is we say if this is W and this is V, 
I just take W plus uh, V dot W, I believe is the right thing to take. Uh, this was, I think that this was the formula we derived last time. Uh, oh yeah, and we're supposed to multiply this by V. All right, and so let's see what we get. Well, if I do this, you know, I have my original class here, and then if I dot this with my V, I get, um, let's see, oh, maybe I want them in the other order. Let's see, so if I do this one with V, I get six uh, minus three minus two minus two. Um, right, and so then I'm, I guess I'm subtracting one of these, which is not what I want. So I guess I want the other condition, that I want them in the other order. So then I, I put the, the worst one at the end and the best one up here. So then this will just be zero times V1. Okay, so if I end up doing it like this, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, you know, I have six, uh, minus two minus two is two. So in this case, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get 8L minus 2E1 minus 4E2 minus 4E3. And then I have two times, you know, all the other ones. And then minus three times E9. And, you know, trying to like find this curve without this formalism seems to me to be really hard because, you know, you have a very singular curve. This is degree eight, but it's a rational curve. And it has, you know, all these, you know, very high multiplicities at all of the points. You know, it has nodal singularities at most of the points and then even higher order singularities at here here and here. Okay, and the idea is that you can just continue this process forever. So you can just rearrange your coefficients so that the, the mildest ones go in front and then compare that, you know, with, uh, with the degree here and use this L minus E1 minus E2 minus E3, uh, reflect across that and you're going to get a curve with higher L degree. So why does that happen when at r equals 9 and not r equals 8? Well, you'll see it's exactly because uh, 9 is 3 squared and the canonical divisor you know, is 3L minus all of these guys. And you know, that shows up here because I have 1L here, 3 of these here. But this was exactly chosen so that when it paired with the canonical divisor, I would get 0. So it all comes back to the canonical divisor. So that that idea, which I kind of stated informally, I want to explore a little more. So the, the general procedure So we want to make some minus one curves on this blow up. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, so we got some, so we, we, got, we have a minus one curve, which, you know, we already know what happens when you do these reflections to the E1, E2, et cetera. You just get, you know, you either get the, other, the others or you get something like a line through the other two of, of one, two, and three. So, we might as well assume this minus one curve isn't one of the exceptional curves. And it's just got the form AL minus B1E minus B2E2 minus et cetera down through B9E9. And I wanna require that the, the Bs are in ascending order. Okay, and so, and so in particular, it's, this is just gonna, you know, we're going to have that the average of the first three b's is going to be less than the average, is going to be less than or equal to the average of all the b's. So we have that uh, b1 plus b2 plus b3 is less than or equal to sum of the bi 
over 9. Okay, and then, you know, we can make this happen, or this should be over 3, there we go. So the sum of three of them should be, you know, at least, uh, less than or equal to 3 times the average, and the average is you just sum and divide by 9. Okay, and so the other things are we have the conditions that if I dot this with itself, I should get minus 1. And if I dot it with the canonical divisor, um, then I should get minus 1. So if I dot it with the anti-canonical divisor, I should get 1. So if I have the minus k dot my curve is equal to 1, well, what does this say? This says that 3a uh, minus the sum of the bi's is equal to minus 1. OK, and so then that in particular tells us that a minus the sum of the bi over 3 is equal to minus 1. So a is equal to negative 1 plus sum of the bi over 3. OK. So now what this tells me is I can now use this to do my reflection. And if I take, uh, if I take c dot l minus e1 minus e2 minus e3, well, this is going to be equal to a minus uh, yeah, so this would be a minus uh, let's see, hopefully the signs are lining up here. So yes, yeah, so this should be a minus b1 minus b2 minus b3. Um, do I want right? And then the point is that this guy, so this guy is bounded by bi over three, um, and then bi over three is just you know negative one, you know, you know that's just a plus one. Excuse me, but is it, uh, you divide this by 3, right? Uh, which one by 3? So this, this is 3a minus sum of bi is equal to my plus b. Oh, it should be a 1 third. That's yeah. right. There we go. Good point. OK, so that should be sum of the bi over 3 should be uh, a plus a third. Um, so what do I have here? So then a I can substitute for. Uh, what do I have here? I should have sum of all the bi over 3 plus a third uh, oh, sorry, minus a third. There we go. Minus b1 minus b2 minus b3. Okay, and then this guy, yeah, and then I guess the point here is that so. So what do we have to guarantee? I guess we have to guarantee that the, the b's are not all the same. They're not like too close to each other. Um, but yeah, so the point here is that this will be, so this will certainly be greater than or equal to, to minus a third. But I think we really like it. Let's see, if we had it on the other side, then that would be much better. Um, yeah. So ideally, this would have been a proof that, like, you know, you just keep repeating this procedure, and eventually you get um, get where you want to be. Let's see here. So um, as long as the bi's are not like too close to each other, then it's fine. Um, let's see. I just want to confirm that I have all of the signs correct. Let's see. So this is a minus one curve. And if I suppose that like all of the b's were equal, say, so let's say, yeah, so if they were all, yeah, if they were all equal, then I guess I'd be in trouble. But I think that can't happen because of, 
um, then you know it's, then I don't get like a perfect square. So yeah, so I think so. So I think what we've confirmed is that, we, that this guy is greater than or equal to minus a third, um, and then. Yeah, so the idea should be that, you know, if you get, so, you know, when, so you get either zero or one or something bigger. And so what we want to do is we want to rule out zero. So, so to get zero, what you'd have to have is you'd have to have that, um, yeah. So basically, I, I think what I want to claim is that this inequality is strict somehow. Um, and then, yeah, and so then that strictness is going to give me strictness here, but, you know, it's still not good enough because I need to get over, you know, not just zero, but up to one. So let's see here. Okay, so I, yeah, I, I think I'm stuck at this point. Um, I'm, I'm probably not gonna be able to figure this out like at the board. Um, so I think, you know, I invite you to like, you know, kind of poke at this and see if you can figure out a proof yourselves. So, you know, when, you, when the instructor fails to figure out something at the board, that, that makes it an exercise, right? There's going to be a lot of exercises today. So exercise, you know, finish the rest of this proof. Um, you know, so, but, you know, you can kind of intuitively see the idea as you kind of, as you move the coefficients so that uh, to make this pairing as positive as possible. And then you can always at least get it to zero. Um, and then, let's see, so, yeah. Yeah, it would be nice if this had been a one-third instead of a minus one-third. And I think when I worked this out before, I maybe flipped the sign accidentally, but I don't think I made a mistake here. Let's see. Um, you know, if I, if I also use the fact that it's a minus one curve, I get the fact that uh, a squared minus the sum of bi squared is equal to minus one. But I don't know if this is actually helpful. Um, let's see, so, so for one thing, I'm comparing the sum of the bi squared with the sum of the bi, which is always like a little bit tricky. Um, I suppose if the bi are very close together, then you can, you know, say something about comparing this sum to, to that one. Maybe you can rule out that, um, you know, you, you know, maybe you can rule out that that this uh, equality, the inequality, is too close together. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think there's some sort of, you know, maybe you can do some tricky things with various inequalities to sort this out, but. Um, I'm going to leave it here because I don't want to go like poking off in a random direction and waste class time. Okay, so you know the other thing I want to talk about with with respect to this case. So the so the idea is so we didn't quite succeed in proving that there are infinitely many minus one curves on this thing, but I can give you another proof actually, which is a little, um, you know, it's a little, you know, it's a little funny, but it, you know it does work. Um, so the other the other idea is if you suppose ah, excuse me, but yeah. so, so any the things you want to say is that anyway this product is more or less you know, anyway greater than zero, so it yeah. keep increasing this degree of error. So that's the argument that Yeah, that's the argument I want to make. But, oh, I, I see. but you know, if I get it to zero it's not good enough. Oh, I see. So if I get it above zero, if I say any class I can do this, you know, I can move it around and then apply this ninth, this yeah, ninth reflection to yeah. to boost the L degree, then I can just keep doing it forever, and then I'll say I have infinitely many minus one curves. I see. So that's the argument, but uh, this inequality didn't quite work out in the direction. You know, I would really like this to be a one third, or, you know, something positive. Since it's negative, it kind of gives me problems. I see. Yeah. But then why this argument fail for delta just surface? So degree one. Uh, yeah, so in the degree one case, uh, you know, instead of having a nine here, um, you know, I only have eight. Right. So let's see. So what's what's happening there? Um, so then, you know, I mean, this was really three ninths, right? So instead, this is going to be a three eighths. 
in the in the del pezzo surface. So this is one third, but you know it would be three eighths in the del pezzo case. And so, um, but the thing that's showing up here is the sum of the bi over three still, and that's not the same as three eighths the sum of the bi. So you have that difference. It's like these only become equal once you get to nine, and so once you go over nine, then this is you know you get you get even better of a bound. So I suppose this this really, uh, I mean this probably works quite well to show that you have infinitely many minus one curves and you have more than nine points. But uh, sort of hoping it would work for nine points as well. And I think it does work. You just kind of have to tweak this argument a little bit. Um, I think a correct version of this argument is probably in that Mukai paper I mentioned. Um, the thing I'm going to talk about next is um, in a paper of Totaro's about. Uh, uh, Bert Totaro uh, about the uh, cone conjecture for uh, surfaces. So uh, what I want to think about now is that we have r equals 9, and then the 9 points are the intersection of two genus 1 curves. And so this is just a, you know, a dimension 1 condition, because you take eight general points, and then there's a pencil that occurs to them, and then that gives you the ninth point. And the idea now is that if you blow up at the nine points, then this pencil gives you a map to P1, and then every minus one curve gives you a section. So if you have a minus one curve, that gives you a section. But this x over the generic point, it's a genus one curve, so this is an elliptic curve over the base, you know, at least uh, over an open set, and in fact, you know, it has a, a global group structure, you know, because the degenerate fibers, uh, well, they look like, um, you know, those are going to be nodal rational curves, and so, you know, if you remove the bad point, that's still a group. And so, you know, there's a group structure on minus one curves. Okay, because this is a you know it's a genus one curve of the base. So once you have, uh, you know, one minus one curve that you choose to be your base point to be the zero of your group, then the rest of them inherit that structure. Or if you prefer, you can think there's the natural group structure on the zero degree classes, so which is differences of minus one curves, and then on the minus one curves that acts in as a torsor. But you know that's just you know, two ways of looking at the same thing. So it's like, it's a torso for the group, or if you pick a point, then it becomes isomorphic to the group. Okay, so, so one thing this gives us is that it gives us a way to show there are infinitely many minus one groups. At least if we pick the points generally enough. Because the idea could be that we pick one of our points, you know, to be the uh, uh, you know just to be the 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 identity of the group law, so one of one of like e one, and then e two is another point, and then you just say well somewhere in the pencil, you know we get to choose like let's just say we choose our first elliptic curve uh, to be whatever we want. We probably shouldn't have called these e, so let's maybe call them c one and c two for cubic. Uh, and so you say okay well I have my you know, my elliptic curve. And so maybe this is my point one. And then I'm allowed to pick point two to be like whatever. So the torsion points, you know, if this is chosen to be the origin, the identity of the group law, then I can pick, you know, all my other points. I can just pick them to be independent. So I can just say, well, I can just choose P1, P2 to be like some non torsion class. You know, so we'll just say P2 is just some random point. And then likewise for P3, I can just pick all the points random, but it really only takes one. So if I pick all the points randomly, then in one of the fibers, then the, uh, then the, the subgroup generated by those points is going to look like a Z8. It's going to look like, you know, it's going to be a free abelian group generated by the differences between 
uh, each of the points in one. And so that's going to guarantee that the curve of the generic point has higher rank. Because if like E2, so if E2 minus E1, which is, you know, if that was were a torsion class in this picture, it would have to be a torsion class here too. But we can choose the point so it's not. So we can choose. So if we choose it, choose the points generically. Then that tells us that the uh, the 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 group of the elliptic curve x over the generic point of P one has rank eight. And of course, you know, you can make the rank smaller if you like, but in, in general, it'll have rank eight, and its group is going to be uh, eight copies of the integers. And well, what are the points of that? They correspond to the minus one curves here. So, you know, this gives you infinitely many points of the elliptic curve, infinitely many minus one curves. So, in the case where all of the points are the intersection of two genus one curves, this works. And then you can kind of say, well, you know, uh, if a minus one class exists on that one, it also exists when I uh, scoot one of the points away. So if I choose just nine random points in P2, then they won't have this structure because uh, it's a co-dimension one condition for nine points to be the intersection of two genus one curves. But, uh, you know, moving, you know, this, this section existing is an open condition. So, you know, having minus one curves in any given class, it's an open condition. So if I, if I tweak the point a little bit, that class still exists. Okay, so, um, right. So the next thing I wanna talk about is, although we have this kind of, what seems like a pathological case here, that we have like too much stuff, um, what I want to say is that, in fact, there's a conjecture that comes to our rescue called the Kawamata Morrison Cone Conjecture, which says that under the right conditions, even though Kx may not be negative enough to guarantee that the cone of curves is finitely generated, uh, what we have instead is that it's sort of finitely generated up to the automorphisms of the variety. So what does this conjecture say? Well, it says that if kx is trivial, so if it's numerically equivalent to zero, this is Calabi Yao case, then um, the action of the automorphism group of x on the cone of curves as a rational polyhedral uh, fundamental domain. So it's a, you know, I guess I should say maybe I want finitely generated in here too. Yeah, so the idea here is that you get this like you know strange picture where you have a, points accumulating and accumulating, but that's happening because what you're getting is that all those minus one curves are translates under a group action of minus one curves that you started with. Well, here, I mean, here kx is not numerically trivial, but in fact you can widen the conjecture a little bit. So, 
you know, here in the case of this elliptic vibration, you know, I can find, I can just take two of the fibers and I can just say, well, Kx plus a half the first fiber plus a half the second fiber is trivial. And so this is the case for x is the, uh, you know, here I have x from down to p1, and then this is, you know, uh, an elliptic vibration. And, you know, what's significant here is that you know, these coefficients, that they're less than one. So this is a condition, uh, the significance of this condition is that it makes uh, x with the two fibers into a KLT pair. And if I just had the one, if I just had the one thing, it wouldn't be KLT, it would be what's called log canonical. So this is something we'll get into when we talk about singularities of the minimal model program. But this is like one place where the, uh, where it's, you know, basically having uh, having a pole of order one is somehow like a lot worse than having, you know, a pole of fractional order, which is, which really just means, you know, you go, and you go to some branch cover and you have a pole of order one. Okay, so, yeah, so, so basically all I'm saying is that you can kind of tweak this conjecture so that it applies in this case. And in fact, we see the conjecture is true in this case, because here, we have that the automorphisms of x, particularly they contain, you know, this z8 given by the, uh, the minus one curves. And so, yeah, this cone is generated by the minus one curves, of which there are infinitely many, but up to automorphism, there are only finitely many of minus one curves. So you do get this nice polyhedral fundamental domain, and the group law on the elliptic curve just kind of moves it around. So the schematic picture might be something like this, where where you know maybe this is your fundamental domain, and then as you apply the group law, you can kind of imagine it as a z instead of a z to the eight, but it's you know it's a higher dimensional picture, and then you can just kind of move it either direction. And so this strange, uh, infinitely generated cone, really it's uh, hiding some finitely generated structure. Okay, so that's one case. Uh, I want to show you one other case. So I, you know, before I show you that case, I should tell you this conjecture is extremely difficult. Um, in general, no one has any idea how to prove it. Um, one of the problems with proving it is like, where do you get this? You know, you have some x where the cone is poorly behaved. Where do you come up with an automorphism? And people don't really know. Um, so, and I've, I've heard people tell me that this is sort of thought of as like the next step beyond the abundance conjecture is kind of, is, is this sort of statement. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, if you could even just produce one automorphism that's non-trivial, I think that would be a huge deal. Like if you just, Especially if you can find an automorphism that that you know is non-torsion, that it's, there's no power of it which is the identity or restricts the identity on uh, on the card group, then I think that would be a huge deal. But I think people really know very little about this conjecture. Um, I mean, I think I think the conjecture is known for surfaces, but there's not really that many surfaces which it applies to. It's you know, still pretty impressive that we know this for K3 surfaces, for sure. Um, so the example I want to show you is not a K3 surface, but it's an abelian surface. So the example I want to talk about is uh, if you have the product of two elliptic curves, or an elliptic curve with itself, C be a genus one curve, and you know, so as an elliptic curve, we assign a point to this. If we just choose a point on there to, to act as the origin, uh, the identity element, then um, you know you can ask whether this curve has any 
sort of special endomorphisms. And the ones that do are called complex multiplication. But if, if it doesn't, we assume we assume that it doesn't have any, and it's co not complex multiplication. Then if we look at the, uh, the Neron Severi group of C cross C, this is going to be my surface, uh, then this is going to be look like Z3. And so what are the generators? Well, one generator is just you take a point cross C. So, you know, you have your surface. And then you can take a vertical fiber. You can also take a horizontal fiber. Or you can take the diagonal. You have the diagonal. And it takes a little kind of thinking, but in fact, the diagonal is not the sum of the two, these two guys. And I mean, you can see that kind of plainly because, well, what's the self-intersection of, of one of the fibers? Well, it's, you know, it's a fiber, so you can move it to clear the zero. Um, and then likewise, well, you know, the projection of the other fiber, that's also self-intersection zero. But if you take this guy, you know, this is also, this is like, you know, you can just move the diagonal by, instead of taking the diagonal, I can just take uh, x, you know, x plus p for some p that's non-zero. This is equivalent to the diagonal, but it doesn't intersect the diagonal. So you can kind of think of the diagonal as another way of expressing this as a product uh, of the curve with itself. So in particular, this shows that this is an independent class. And in general, what this condition about endomorphisms does, well, in particular, it rules out having like, you know, any funny, you know, curve of degree one in one direction and high degree in another direction. But in fact, you, it just, it's going to rule out, um, you know, it's, it's just going to rule out having, um, uh, more classes in this Neron Severi group. So, you know, there's many ways to look at this. Uh, so, one way you can think about this is in terms of the Hodge diamond. So, you know, so for an elliptic curve, so for the curve, the Hodge diamond, well, not very complicated. I just have a one. I think I should have like a one, one, one. Um, right, because you know it's just a curve. When you get up to a surface, these things get more complicated. And what do you get? Well, you get uh, for C cross C, you get one. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it should be one four six four one. So then I have a one four one two two one. So this is what the Hodge diamond of an abelian surface looks like. And so you kind of see that. Oh, okay. Well, here this is where the one one classes live. And I know that I have at least three of them that are algebraic because I just told you three of them. And then the question is, do we have a fourth? And the idea is that if if the curve has a non-trivial endomorphism then that sticks a fourth in there. But otherwise, this fourth one doesn't line up with the, uh, you, know, you know, it's the usual Hodge theory argument where uh, as like a complex vector space, this is four dimensional. But in terms of the lattice of uh, integer um, classes, there's only a rank three guy that intersects this. So here, we're gonna say that uh, we have that H, uh, I guess this should be like H2Z, maybe I want the upper two. It's always been clear to me. I think I want, yeah, H2Z intersect H11R. This has, you know, the, the rank of this is either equal to three or four. So what we're interested in the, is in the case where it's three, because that's less complicated than when it's four. Okay, so what's going on in this picture? Well, I've given you three classes that generate, and I've told you uh, how they intersect each other. So 
So the idea, and you can just see from the picture how they intersect, is that any pair of these classes that are different intersect, um, but you know the but they also don't uh, you know eat, the self intersections are all zero. So the intersection form you get looks like this. Okay, so this is a quadratic form on a three dimensional vector space. And if you look at the positive classes for that quadratic form, it's going to form a circular cone. And so that's what we get, is we actually get that uh, the cone of effective classes inside the Nairn Severi space, F of S, so take the closure of that, that's just going to look like a circular cone inside here. Okay, so you get this nice circular cone. Um, but the conjecture, if it's true for this, and it is, is supposed to tell us that there's a rational polyhedral finally generated, you know, nice fundamental domain for, uh, you know, for, you know, some group action on this guy. And, well, what's the idea? Is that you can just draw the triangle coming from these three classes. So you have E1, uh, let's, let's just call these F1 for one fiber, F2 for the projection the other way, and then this one here should be the uh, um, uh, where's this one? This one is the diagonal. Okay, and then there's you know there, there's going to be some group that acts on this to move these classes around. So how does that actually work in practice? Well, in particular, well, you can switch F1 and F2, which doesn't really do very much because uh, you know, you're just keeping, that's gonna fix the diagonal. But what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be a way to flip over each of these sides. So I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm just gonna describe how do you flip this guy over this side? So what is, What is, what is the triangle over here? So there's some point here, which I want to figure out what class is this, because this, this should give me some automorphism of my surface that's going to fix this line, the F1 and the F2, but send the diagonal to some other class. So what is that? Well, the idea is what you do is you take, uh, you know, you know, it, it's, it's going to be that I want, you know, the graph of some relation on the curve with itself, right? And the relation that I want is I want something that, that comes from an automorphism and doesn't change what's happening to F1 and F2. And so what I do is on one of the, on one of the copies of the curve, I take the inverse map as a group, and then on the other one, I do nothing. So what I do is I do, you know, so I do the involution cross the identity. And that's going to keep, you know, both kinds of fibers, they're going to stay the same type of fiber. But the diagonal is going to get sent to whatever this is, the graph of the involution, the inverse map. And then you can check, uh, you know, it's, you know, so you can check that, well, in particular, if you intersect this with the diagonal, you don't get zero, right? Because the fixed points of the involution are the four two torsion points. So this, when you intersect it with the diagonal, you get four as opposed to zero. So I really have changed from this to something else. And so then you can actually, like, by computing intersection numbers, you can work out exactly what this point is. And then you can work out what the group structure is, that act, how, it, how the group of automorphisms, how you can cook up automorphisms of this guy that'll tile this entire circle with triangles. OK, so I better stop here. I think I'm slightly over time. Um, but that'll be it for today. Uh, next time we'll move on to a new topic.